Hi, and welcome to a special season of the Holistic Matters podcast series focused on medicinal herbs and their unique place in the holistic approach to health. Over the next couple of months, nutritionist Sarah Lebrun Blaschka will be talking with Professor Carrie Bone and other herbal industry leaders about the role of medicinal herbs and herbal remedies in human health. This month, we're talking about the innate immune system, the inflammatory response, and the cytokine storm, particularly in the context of pathogenic infections and the role of herbs like echinacea, astragalus, and andrographis. So today I'm here with Carrie Bone, one of the leading experts in the area of herbal medicine um, globally. And, you know, there's a lot of information that is being derived right now in regards to cytokines and the cytokine storm and how nutrients and herbs have an interplay with that. And so um, I'd like to start, Carrie, just by kind of giving you, getting your insight a little bit first on, you know, the immune system and how it plays a role with the cytokines, because the cytokines are really key, but you know, right now they're getting maybe a lot of bad play. And so if you could just dive a little bit deeper and explain the role in the immune response. Absolutely. Thanks, Sarah. Um, So cytokines are in effect the language of the immune system and they play a critical role in initiating and sustaining both aspects of our immune response. And And the two aspects of the immune response are the innate side, which is the response that happens immediately once a pathogen is detected. And then there's the adaptive side, which takes some days where you produce either antibodies or cell-mediated killing of the pathogen or of infected cells. So that's the adaptive immunity, and that takes a few days to develop. So when we look at the innate immune response, which is your initial reaction to a pathogen, what happens is the innate immune cells have pattern recognition receptors that will detect whether uh, some sort of uh, material, some molecular structure is foreign. And if that's the case, it will capture that and present it via these uh, dendritic cells or macrophages will present it for processing. And to facilitate that presentation and to initiate an immune response against that antigenic material suspected of being foreign, cytokines are used to signal and uh, alert the immune cells. So cytokines, although they're often seen as the bad guys because they generate inflammation and fever, they're actually very critical in initiating a proper, quick, efficient immune response. So we also have this situation uh, when a pathogen is detected that other cytokines, and sometimes the same ones, will be released because cytokines are a very, very big class of molecules. Other cytokines will be released and those other cytokines will stimulate an inflammatory response and also maybe drive up the temperature and create a febrile response. Now that's all part of a defensive mechanism. So so cytokines initiate an immune response and then they arm it. They arm the immune response as in armor. Um, So, Often, I think, what's being conflated with concerns about herbs and cytokine storms is the two different aspects of cytokines in the immune response. They have a signaling role and they have a response role. And just because a herb, for example, might be shown in a test tube experiment, and I'll talk a bit about test tube experiments, just because a herb might be shown in a test tube experiment to initiate a a proper signaling role, it doesn't mean it's going to overexcite the inflammatory response aspect of the immune system. 
You know, I think that's a really important point. You know, um, I think we get confused a lot that inflammation is all bad, right? But as you indicated, you know, if, if you don't have inflammation, you're not able to have that initial fight, right? Um, and But it's when it kind of goes awry that is when we see chronic inflammation and many issues and this term, the cytokine storm, you mentioned it earlier, it was originally coined kind of in the 90s and then has made a reinsurgence. And, um, you know, when I think of cytokine storm, I think back to when I was working in a more clinical setting and the ARDS, you know, um, in respiratory. Uh, so can you kind of talk a little bit more about the, like, how this is appropriate now and what, what is like the cytokine storm? Sure, sure. So <clears throat> cytokine storm is where you get an excessive level of pro-inflammatory cytokines that uh, initiate widespread tissue damage. And often what can happen, for example, in someone with cytokine storm is they get renal failure because the intense level of cytokines actually damage the kidneys. So it's nothing new. Um, it was first recognized as a term in 1993 to describe a graft versus host disease. But in fact, it's been around for as long as pathogens have been around. And it was previously recognized under the term sepsis. So sepsis, cytokine storm, they're two sides of the same coin. So if someone has a septic reaction, or it's also been described as toxic shock syndrome and all of these things. It's about cytokine storm. And the toxicity is from the cytokine. So it's a kind of an auto toxicity. Um, it wasn't until about 2003, about 10 years later, it was first used in 1993, first used to describe graft versus host disease, which is an autoimmune type reaction that happens often after transplants, for example. But in 2003, it was also shown to be associated with severe reactions to influenza virus, and then a whole range of pathogens, bacterial, viral, fungal. There's no agreed definition. It's, it's, it's a term that's fairly loosely used. But obviously, when it happens, the the infection goes into a very severe phase due to this massive overproduction of cytokines. So I think the point to emphasize about cytokine storm is it's happening as a late stage response to an infection. And it happens when the infection is not properly controlled. So if you initiate a good innate immune response, you control the levels of the pathogen, you're not going to get to a level of this late stage response, uh, which involves cytokine storm. So what is actually going on? Well, it's thought that the pathogen multiplies to such levels that it's destroying tissue on a widespread nature. And that can be, for example, in the respiratory system. This damaged and destroyed tissue creates its own innate immune response um, due to it dying via necrosis. So there was an immunologist called Polly Matzinger and she developed the danger theory of immunology. And what, what the basic um, underlying hypothesis of the danger theory or is, is that when cells die necrotically, fragments of those cells become visible to the immune system and they generate what's called a danger response from the immune system. And that's especially in the innate side of the immune system. So the innate side of the immune system mounts this response, uh, which involves cytokines. So cytokine storm, in other words, is a direct <laughs> response to massive tissue damage, in this case, if it's a pathogen generated cytokine storm from the pathogen. Um, it's not a case of an immune system overreacting 
to the pathogen. It's, a, it's an inappropriate response of the innate immune system to the high level of damage that the pathogen is generating. And to me, surely this argues for enhancing the efficiency of the immune response at the earlier stages of infection. So the levels of that pathogen don't build up to such high levels to generate a cytokine storm. And it's inappropriate to conflate the two concepts that something which might make immune signaling via cytokines more efficient, like a herb, will then somehow uh, exacerbate this late stage of an infection where the high levels of cytokines are being generated. In fact, if we look at that scenario where someone is actually suffering from cytokine storm, um, it's not a situation where someone's going to be going in with you know a herbal tablet and say, here, take this. The person is in ICU in lockdown. So, so it's, it's kind of a baffling idea why people would think anyone's going to be giving herbs to someone at that late stage anyway. The whole point is to use the herbs early on, especially as preventatives, to at least stop, to make the, stop the infection or at least make it milder. And then when the person actually has the infection, maybe different herbs to make the immune response more efficient to keep the levels of pathogen down. But once someone goes into cytokine storm, you're not going to be giving them herbs. So, so th this whole concept of being concerned about giving herbs because of exaggerating a cytokine storm, when that's a, a late uh, medical you know, ICU stage of an infection, to me, it just doesn't make any sense. It, you know, I was just talking with um, one of my naturopathic friends today, and we were having this exact same discussion, you know, um, the idea of, you know, somebody taking these herbs during, you know, an ICU event is is not practical, right? In no. Nature. Um, Maybe in China. Maybe in China, but uh, no, certainly not not in the US or Australia. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it's interesting, you know, um, the this discussion, and, and it's quite broad across, you know, um, probably the globe of the issue with not only herbs, but also nutrients. You know, um, there's been discussion about vitamin D3 as a risk factor. And I've seen and heard people, you know, concerned that they're not going to take vitamin D. Well, obviously, we need to still take vitamin D to maintain our health. And many of us are inside. So, you know, I think the, I think the, the things are going a bit crazy. You know, with, with uh, don't go out in the sun. You might get cytokine storm. Come on, guys. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, it's like, of course, you need D3. It's an essential nutrient. It's important yes. for your overall health. If you're not going outside enough, you need those, you know, and the herbs, to your point, um, you know, are not going to be administered at the point of cytokine storm. And so, no, like, maybe we can just touch on, you know, some of the specific herbs and actually their action before it would ever get to that point and why yeah, they yeah. have benefit. Um, you know, some of the herbs and, as I said, nutrients that have been mentioned, such as echinacea. Or astragalus, yeah. Astragalus, yeah. the elderberry. Yeah. Uh, we see there's been discussion on some of the medicinal mushrooms and so on. So maybe we can kind of um, boil that down by herb to help uh, get a little better understanding by sure. of the herbs. Sure, sure. And where, where I think the misunderstanding has arisen is because there's been test tube experiments that have shown that as part of their initiation of an facilitation of an innate immune response, at least in test tubes, that herbs increase the risk of cytokines. Um, and there's also been a study, for example, with elderberry, where the cytokines went up 25 times. But this is, this is actually a good thing, because what it's suggesting, if it's true, and I'll come to that if it's true, what it is suggesting is that you're improving the initial efficiency of the immune response by enhancing not cytokine-generated inflammation, 
but cytokine generated signaling. And so you're more likely to deal effectively with the pathogen in the early stages and hence circumvent any late stage scenario of high levels of pathogen that might be necrotically killing masses of cells and generating a cytokine storm. So I now like to come to this point if it's true, because uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff going around and we can talk about, oh, this herb is antiviral and this that herb is antiviral or, and, and even this drug is antiviral <laughs> or that drug is antiviral. And it's all based largely on test tube research. That's a long, long way from clinical reality. And it's, it's certainly the case for any drug that it's a long, long way from clinical reality. And it's even more so with a herb because with a herb, you have a mixture of chemicals. So when they design a drug, it's designed to have bioavailability in the body. It's designed to be absorbed and get to the target tissues at sufficient quantities to deliver an effect. And even then, effects in test tubes don't necessarily translate into real effects in the body because a test tube is a, a, an in vitro test is an artificial set of circumstances. And there could be uh, unknown factors in the body that influence that and stop it working in a, in a full biological system. And that's even for a drug with given known bioavailability. Well, a, a herbal mix is you know, hundreds of different phytochemicals. Some of them have zero bioavailability. They just pass right through when you take them orally. Others do get absorbed in reasonable quantities, and yet others get changed by your gut flora. They get metabolized by your gut flora into completely different entities. So the whole point is, unless you are choosing a phytochemical with known bioavailability and modeling that in a test tube, unless you're doing that, herbal test tube experiments have severe limitations. And yet we're finding that really significant prescribing decisions are now being made about that. Oh, this herb is bound to be antiviral because it's got lectins that have been shown to kill viruses. Well, lectins have zero bioavailability as such. Or tannins, they have zero bioavailability as such. So they may exert an antiviral effect in the gut lumen, but nowhere else. So it really concerns me that both prescribing decisions are being made on test tube research, firstly, and secondly, uh, that, that uh, contraindications like, oh, you can't use echinacea because it will exacerbate uh, the risk of a cytokine storm are being made on test tube experiments as well, those sort of decisions. We should not be doing this. And I think uh, it, it, we need to have this wake up call and say, come on, guys, get your science in order. Don't make unfounded clinical recommendations from test tube research. It's a constant frustration for me. You can probably hear that in my voice. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I so, think, you know, test tube research gets you to the beginning stage it does not get you to your point, the end stage of understanding that actual clinical outcome. You need to have those types of research to really define that. And, you know, it's important because it gets you to a certain stage, but it's not, should not be a clinical driving factor. Exactly. And it has value in understanding mechanisms, but it mm -hmm. needs to be interpreted with, with appropriate due care and caution. And, and it's not being done. I, I've seen so much misinformation out there recently based on extrapolations from test tube research mm -hmm. and it should not be happening, you know. Anyway, <laughs> I could go on a long time about this. <laughs> I've, I've actually coined a, a, or, a, or a colleague actually for me coined a Latin term and I've been using it since and it's in vitro non veritas. And that is you can't get, you can't get truth out of test tube research. Um, it does have value in certain circumstances. So it, let's take the case of echinacea. Now, in the case of echinacea, and I'm here I'm talking about echinacea root, rich in those phytochemicals that tingle on your tongue called the alkalamines. In the case of that 
uh, we have shown, and by we, I mean literally we, the research group I'm linked with, has shown that the alkali amides are significantly bioavailable. So you say, aha, we can do at least the next level of test tube research, in vitro research, by modelling alkali amides in mm -hmm. in vitro models. And in the case of echinacea, what happens when you model the echinacea alkali amides in vitro in immune response models, what it shows is that it actually primes the immune system, gets it ready for a more efficient response, and cytokines are involved in that, but it doesn't actually release the cytokines. So what happens is you, your, your levels of RNA, which you, know, you need to have there ready to make the proteins, which are the cytokines, are induced by the echinacea alkaline mines, but the actual protein, the cytokines, are not yet made. It's only when challenged are they made. So it shows that it actually arms the immune system. Um, uh, I, I've written about this uh, extensively um, in, uh, in the monograph I wrote in Principles and Practice of mm -hmm. Phytotherapy, the second edition. Um, and Which I have I just right here read... on my desktop, so. Yeah, good, <laughs> thank you. I just got, it's a frustration of every textbook author these days that no one ever reads textbooks, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like uh, someone asked me a whole series of questions and I said, oh, well, actually it's all answered in the appropriate part of my textbook. <laughs> but anyway, um, so um, I'd like to read the summary and, and it was a study that was done with alkaline mites in, in, in a model of, of monocytes, which are, you know, your, part of your innate immune response. And I, I wrote, the results of this study suggest that echinacea acted more as a modulator or facilitator of the immune response rather than, than as an immune stimulant. In resting monocytes that weren't being challenged by a pathogen, it prepared them for a quicker immune response by inducing cytokine messenger RNA. However, in overstimulated monocytes, and they use the model of uh, lipopolysaccharide, but you can also use, um, you be similar to like viral damage that induces a cytokine storm. It first reduced and then extended their response in terms of cytokine production. So rather than uh, overstimulating and wearing out the immune system, it actually, uh, if you like, arms the immune system, but, but not, has it ready, a kind of an active, a higher state of alertness in, in an unchallenged state. But in, in, when it's challenged, like with a pathogen, it actually stops the immune system from overreacting and extends the response over time. Now, this is all from in vitro research, I know, but hey, other people are using in vitro research to say you shouldn't do it. Well, here's in vitro research that says exactly you should. And we should then combine this information with the clinical writings about echinacea from a very important group of herbalists who operated in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And they were called the eclectic physicians and they were US based. Uh, um, there's still a Lloyd Library in Cincinnati that has all of their wonderful writings. Um, so so uh, one of the best eclectic physician writers was Ellingwood. And if you look at the monograph, and, and to me, no one should use echinacea clinically without first reading Ellingwood's monograph. You can download it, it's online. And his monograph on echinacea was what made me uh, eventually, as my patients call me, Mr. Echinacea, <laughs> Dr. Echinacea. Um, 
because uh, it, it's still my number one herb. And at times like these, you can see why it has such a valuable role to play. And I guess that's the other frustrating thing is for someone who's worked and researched echinacea and observed it clinically over more than three decades uh, to see people disparaging its value at a time when it's probably needed most is, is baffling. It's truly baffling. Um, anyway, what Allingwood wrote is he emphasised in several points the valuable role of echinacea for sepsis. In fact, Allingwood said echinacea is the herb for sepsis. So what is sepsis? Sepsis is cytokine storm. So even if you got to a scenario where you could actually give a herb to someone who is in cytokine storm, Ellingwood, who had direct clinical experience over many cases, and don't forget the eclectics also operated during the uh, Spanish flu epidemic in uh, 1919. So Ellingwood is saying, no, no, it's the herb you give if there is sepsis. So when we marry the two together, um, uh, you, you can see uh, that the concerns are just unfounded. And, and, and to me, preclude best clinical practice. Best clinical practice is to use echinacea when there's viral infections going around. But, and I will emphasise that, um, I see its role as more preventative. Now, sometimes the virus is a very potent pathogen, so you can't necessarily prevent it completely, but you can turn it into a mild infection. And it's interesting because there have been recent meta-analyses of echinacea for viral infections, and they've shown that actually, yeah, there's not much of a suggestion that it actually reduces the infection if it's taken after the fact, but there is a growing evidence that it does appear to prevent. So it shifts the whole argument about the use of echinacea is entirely consistent with both my personal use of the herb and clinical experience because on many, many occasions, personally and with patients, you know, I take echinacea every day and I've been taking it every day now for more than 20 years. Um, and touch wood and I will touch wood, I have never missed a day of practice due to illness because I am in clinical practice. And to me, the only way I've been able to do that is echinacea. And I stress echinacea root. So the way to use it, I think, best in these circumstances is as a preventative. So, so uh, I, for example, take a product, I take uh, four tablets a day now. I started off taking two, but, you know, because A, I'm older and B, I'm still highly stressed, and, you know, with my workload. I take four. But here's the, the trick, and I've observed it myself personally and in patients so many times. If you think you're catching something, you increase it. You double or triple it. So, so the other day, I drove my wife to the airport because she was going to look after her mum. And... Uh, came back from the airport and that evening I thought, I don't feel right. I do not feel right. I, over the next few hours, I took a dozen echinacea. I woke up perfectly well. So can you address then, you know, there's this um, sometimes theory or rumor, however you want to address, that some people are concerned with long-term use of echinacea. And I'm sure you've heard this over and over, but I think it's still, it still seeps out there. Oh, it's still out there. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so I call all this the echinacea rules and regulations. I break all of them. <laughs> oh, you can't give it because it will give cause cytokine storm. Oh, you can't use it long term because it'll wear out your immune system. Oh, you can't give it an autoimmune disease because it'll make it worse. Uh, I break all of them. There's no basis for any of these echinacea rules and regulations. It's actually valuable in autoimmune disease. That's another discussion we can have on another day. Um, yeah, I've. it doesn't wear out your immune system. That's based, on, again, on a misunderstanding. In this case, not of test tube research, but of, right. of clinical research where there was an effect shown for five days and then it wore off. Well, that effect after five days 
on the immune system in humans wore off because they stopped giving the echinacea. <laughs> it was a standard washout, mm -hmm. treatment washout effect. Right. It wasn't that the echinacea had stopped working, but because it was in German, the people who originally translated the paper or looked at the paper missed that point, and hence the myth got propagated and there it goes forever. Now, I do want to stress about everything that I'm talking about. It is echinacea root. Um, the, the traditional form used by the eclectics, used by the Native Americans, that is rich in these alkalamides that, you know, when you chew on the root or, or chew on a tablet, explodes your mouth out, you know, with these uh, tingling uh, sens sensation. Um, uh, Almost um, like chewing on a 10 volt battery. Is, uh, I think the, yeah, way, the first is. time it that I had yeah. it made me think of the liquid form. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so, so that's echinacea. So, so in summary, uh, test tube research actually for an alkalamide rich preparation like echinacea root actually supports that it's unlikely to cause cytokine storm. And, and certainly the early eclectics and Allingwood in particular actually considered it to be valuable during uh, cytokine storm. So no concerns there. But I do want to emphasize its role is preventative. So yes, I still take some when I actually get sick, but then I move over to andrographis. I use a formulation that has some echinacea root in and with the andrographis. But to me, once a person actually has the infection, andrographis is, is the best herb. So I'll, I'll tell you a little story. Um, I, was, I was giving a seminar in Houston and I thought, ah, I don't, I don't feel good. <laughs> I don't feel good. I think I'm catching something. This is about uh, eight, ten years ago, and uh, and so I started uh, taking some echinacea in high doses. And because I was probably a bit late in whacking up those doses, I I, I came down unwell. So I switched over to andrographis, and then ta started taking massive doses of andrographis. And when I woke up the next morning, I had to fly to San Francisco and um, for a seminar there. And I thought, oh, this is an interesting virus. Not only, you know, do I have all these flu-like symptoms, you know, I've got all these gut problems as well. And then I realized, oh, no, I think that's due to andrographis overdose. <laughs> you know, so I, had to, I backed off the andrographis a little bit. But, yeah, I was taking up, I don't know, 16, 18 tablets in a day, that sort of thing. And so... So, of course, uh, I get from Houston to Dallas, and that was a time that American Airlines had some problem with their planes, and, and so they grounded heaps of them. So there I was waiting five hours in, you know, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, uh, feeling absolutely terrible, occasionally having my andrographis with a bit of echinacea as well <laughs> um, thrown in. Got to San Francisco, still unwell, did an eight-hour seminar the next day, still unwell, very unwell, you know, more than 200 people. So you can imagine I, it was nonstop for eight hours and all during lunch and all during the breaks. And so that night I got on the plane to fly to Australia and still taking my andrographis and still taking my echinacea. And I woke up, I got to sleep on the plane and I woke up about five hours before we were getting to Australia and I felt perfectly well. So that's that's what you can do. But it's right. echinacea prevention, andrographis treatment. Now, there's another aspect that I would do if a person has a fever, and that is the these herbs called these diaphoretic herbs, and they they help you manage the fever. So so. Um, one of the characteristics of cytokine storm, but even before that, of just a more florid sort of a viral or bacterial infection is fever. And fever mm -hmm. is a good thing as long as it's controlled. So the herbalists developed these diaphoretic, D-I-A-P-H-O-R-E-T-I-C, these diaphoretic herbs um, on, on the basis of clinical observation that would manage fever. And it's interesting that when you look at the writings of the eclectics around the Spanish flu epidemic, they were emphasizing the value of diaphoretic herbs to help manage the febrile phase. 
And of course, what drives fever is cytokines. Therefore, if diaphoretic herbs can bring down fevers, and the eclectics were giving examples of bringing the, you know, the fever down three or four degrees Fahrenheit, if diaphoretics can bring down fevers, they are obviously lowering the cytokine response. And these herbs are so readily available and best taken as hot teas. Um, there's echinacea, there's yarrow, there's chamomile. Sorry, mm -hmm. echinacea, I've got it on the brain. There's peppermint, <laughs> <laughs> peppermint, mm -hmm. chamomile, yarrow, you know, lime flowers. A lot of these teas are available and just pepper, peppermint on its own can, mm -hmm. can be great value as a diaphoretic. Some of the more serious clinical ones are herbs like pleurisy root, and, you know, that's available too. Um, and, and if you're using, for example, pleurisy root as, and you want to get the best diaphoretic, use the liquid version and, and take it with hot water mm -hmm. because they're best taken hot. So, so one thing I didn't do for that example, you know, when I was going from Houston to San Francisco is I, I couldn't take advantage of diaphoretic herbs, but in other circumstances, I would have. So I think another herb you want me to talk about is astragalus. Yeah, I think that would be great just to kind of understand that too, because that um, in a lot of the discussions that people are hearing, there is, you know, it, it comes up as part of that discussion too. And how is that different um, and similar to the echinacea story? Well, again, I'm baffled here because um, if you look at the traditional Chinese medicine um, perspective, that in most cases during a, an acute infection, astragalus is contraindicated. Um, mm -hmm. If you are a TCM practitioner and you have skills, you'll know how to use it during an acute infection. But Western herbalists are not trained in that regard. So my view is that Western herbalists generally should not use astragalus during an acute infection. So to me, yeah, why is there a discussion about this? Its role is a prevention and surely people are not suggesting that its preventative role, you know, in the very early stages to prevent an infection, help prevent an infection will somehow lead to a massive excessive immune response in the late stages, uh, uh, you know, in other words, cytokine storm. Um, that's crazy logic to me. It's just that logic of that before you look at any uh, evidence or argument doesn't make sense. And all, all I can say is, well, we have to draw on the experience of people in China. And in the, in the past two decades, as you know, China has had a number of viral epidemics and right. a review was recently done and the most included herb, the most included herb in preventative formulas that were prescribed or recommended or even tested clini uh, clinically during these viral epidemics were, was astragalus. It was the number one herb. So w what are we saying? The Chinese have got it wrong. They don't even understand their own system. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I want to emphasize that, that some of these viruses were linked to cytokine storms. So the Chinese have no hesitation in using astragalus preventatively for viral infections, and we should not as well. Right. I think, you know, part of the challenge is that the United States is also expanding and learning more about herbal practices, right? And so that becomes part of the overall challenge of understanding when is the right time and how does an herb have an overall effect. Um, and so I think as a whole, like there's probably a lot more knowledge that American practitioners can gain, right? Um, that we need to dive deeper and have more uh, understanding. Uh, well, I, I would I would say that uh, uh, can I can I just say that <laughs> I, I trained in the UK, mm -hmm. and and probably the people who have email been emailing the most saying, oh. I can't believe all these concerns, all, the, all my colleagues, my herbalist colleagues are too scared to provide, to prescribe echinacea and astragalus for viral infections now because of this cytokine storm. So, you know, potential risks. So, so uh, 
No, I don't think, I think it's across the board. I think it's just what happens in this day and age is, is misinformation spreads. People don't feel, I guess, confident to make those decisions themselves. So, so they rather err on the side of caution. And I, look, I think that's commendable, but 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 please listen to the arguments the other way as per as per this interview. So, Carrie, I appreciate um, you taking time to discuss this very you know topical discussion. And obviously, this discussion is long beyond this. I mean, people are having cytokine storm, sepsis um, all the time. And so we need to think about how do we generally support our overall health with herbs and um, other nutrition and how we appropriately, you know, work with our patients. Any last kind of takeaways that you would want people to understand? Yeah, yes, yes. That I, I think that. If sepsis is a fear for someone during an infection, then the best way to avoid that happening is for the person to be as healthy as possible. Mm -hmm. We know that sepsis mainly occurs in at-risk people, you know, people with cardiovascular problems, people with renal problems, being overweight, type 2 diabetes and so on. They are more at risk and, and obviously people with lung issues. They are more at risk. So, so part of the story should be through diet, through supplements, through herbs, getting the person as healthy as possible. And in times of challenge, echinacea and astragalus are part of that recipe, a significant part of that recipe. But obviously look at the whole situation of the person. Are they smokers? You know, you do tremendous value there. Are they vitamin D deficient? Tremendous value there. Look at everything. What's their diet like? Do they have plenty of fiber? Because fiber will give them a healthy microbiome and the healthy microbiome will moderate and enhance their immune responses, just like echinacea and the stragglers will. So look at the whole picture. It, it's, it, it, you know, I, I think if anything, uh, what we're witnessing now to me is a testament for the value of, of, a holistic, natural approach to developing health. I I can't um, agree with you more. I think that has opened our eyes at this point in time to yes. the concept of overall health, and not you know you know a pill for an ill isn't working in our societies across the globe. So yeah, we need we, to think we, a whole approach. We are clearly seeing the breakdown of the pill for an ill model right now and what we need to do is we need to work on health optimization health optimization it's the answer well i think we will all try to optimize our own health i know um, i've been walking and eating probably better because i've had the time to make delicious food and um, i hope you stay safe and healthy too and stress stress levels get the stress levels down that's another yeah, story right, exactly that, that's not good for your health too um <laughs> so we got i've been enjoying ca- my kava kava whenever kava. possible <laughs> yeah kava kava valerian st john's wood. yeah and st john's wood has some antiviral activity and that's that's by the way is not it just in vitro it's in vivo and humans so uh so, yeah so maybe the st john's wort will help there too right <laughs> all right thank you carrie okay thank you sarah Like Carrie said, looking at the bigger picture of health is so important, and this is exactly what we plan to do with this herbal podcast series for the next few months. Thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in, and check back every month for more on stress, sleep, and other important concepts in herbal medicine.